Gregory Allen Thornberry, my dear friend, my brother. Good Friday is coming. Good Friday is coming. Jesus has ridden triumphantly into Jerusalem. The people have placed the palm branches on the ground in front of the mule, in front of the donkey. Jesus has ridden triumphantly into Europe, the Jerusalem of Europe, the Jerusalem of North America, the Jerusalem of South America, as President Dockery reminded us. But Good Friday is coming. There was a time when this was, in our lifetimes, even the lifetimes of you young people who are here, you students of the King's College, when this was in some meaningful sense a Christian culture. It certainly had its flaws, its sins, its delinquencies, its hypocrisies. But it had a capital built up by the presence of the Christian faith in the West, a capital that is, of course, now very badly depleted. And with the depletion of that capital, we see Good Friday coming. There was a time not long ago, even in our lifetimes, even in the lifetimes of you young people here, when we could be comfortable Christians, there was a comfortable Christianity that was possible. Not all that much was asked of us. We had our freedom of speech. We had our freedom of religion. We could enter the public square. We could make our case. We could stand up for what was right. We could do that comfortably, without fear. No need to fear that perhaps we would lose friends, lose social standing, lose professional opportunities. But those days are gone. Gregory Allen Thornberry, my dear friend, my brother, the days of comfortable Christianity are gone. Good Friday is coming. And where will we be on Good Friday? Where will you young people be? Will we be the disciples who fled? Will we be St. Peter who denies Jesus not once but thrice? Oh, it's a dark time, a time of fear, a time of being afraid to speak truth as we know the truth, to speak the truths of the gospel, as Dr. Moore said, the full gospel, the real deal, because there will be a price to be paid. People are already paying that price. Just today, the CEO of a major tech company of Mozilla lost his position because he had dared to contribute a little money, not much, to a proposition in California to support the biblical and natural law understanding of marriage, which has been the Christian understanding and the Jewish understanding and the understanding of the other great traditions of faith and philosophy forever. And yet, when he was exposed as having actually done something to support marriage, he was forced out of his position. And we now see it everywhere. Yes, we hear about the photographers and the cake bakers and the wedding caterers and people who rent facilities and people who would even rent a room in the basement of their homes 
forced out, forced out of business, forced out of professional opportunities because they stand for what the Bible teaches, for what our faith proclaims. Many Christians in these circumstances will be looking for a way to avoid those consequences. They will be looking for a way to slide by, to get by, to make that trade-off that Dr. Moore was talking about. To be able to have the comforts and the consolation of the Christian faith without paying the price on Good Friday. Gregory Allen Thornberry, my dear friend, my brother, I bring up our condition, a condition in which we can no longer be comfortable Christians. That's off the table. That's no longer possible. Because it bears directly, my dear brother, on your mission, on your mission as the president of the King's College, on the responsibilities that you bear any president of any Christian college must ask the question, what am I training? What am I forming? What am I educating my young people to be? What am I leading my faculty to form our young people to be? Christian witnesses, yes, of course. That's always the right answer. In all times and all places, yes, Christian witnesses informed witnesses, witnesses who are prepared to bring the intellect to bear in deepening the understanding one's own and the understanding one communicates of the Christian faith. And of all truth, because as my great friend, your great friend, Chuck Colson, always reminded us, all truth is God's truth. Yes, Christian witnesses. But today, when comfortable Christianity is no longer possible, when Good Friday is coming, Gregory Allen Thornberry, my dear friend, my brother, you are charged to form our young people, to train our young people, to prepare our young people to be martyrs. Oh, it's a hard word. Hard for me to speak, hard for you to hear. I suspect it's especially hard for you young people to hear. Who wants to be a martyr? At some level, we human beings, fallen creatures that we are, we really do want the consolations and the comforts of the Christian faith without having to pay the price, and that's natural. No one need feel guilty about not desiring to be a martyr. But we are where we are in the cultural circumstances in which we find ourselves, and the price will have to be paid. For the entire history of Christianity, and in this 21st century and many places around the globe, being a martyr means literally giving up your life your physical, biological life for the sake of the gospel. For you, it won't mean that, even in these circumstances. What God will be asking you to do, what he will be asking you to take the risk of, is very likely not your physical, biological life. But he may be asking you to give up some things you really treasure, Friends, family, professional opportunities, social standing, nice things, good things, things that aren't bad in themselves, things that we very much don't want to give up. But Gregory Allen Thornberry, my dear friend, my brother, it is your responsibility, it is your charge, to ensure that the young people placed in your charge will not be like the rich young man 
in the gospel who goes to Jesus and asks, what do I need to do to earn eternal life? And who hears Jesus respond, you know the commandments, do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery. And the young man says, I have kept them from my youth. And then Jesus says, but then there is one more thing that you must do. Go and sell what you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And at that, the gospel tells us, the young man's face fell and he went away sad because he had many possessions. He couldn't give it up. He couldn't be a martyr. He was too attached, in his case, to his material possessions. But it likely won't be your material possessions, dear young people. It might be your friends, even family, your social standing, your professional opportunities. And Greg, it really is your responsibility and your faculty's responsibility to help these young people so that when they confront Jesus and are confronted by Jesus and the call is made on them to give up what you have and come and follow me, they will not turn away sad and abandon the Lord because they are so in love with their possessions, not material things, other things, in this age when one can no longer be a comfortable Christian. Our task as teachers is not merely to impart knowledge, even the greatest knowledge, the knowledge of gospel truth, but it's to prepare and form and encourage these young people, literally put courage in these young people so that on Good Friday at 3 o'clock when Jesus cries, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, and then says it is finished, these young people will not be like the other disciples gone in fear, abandoning the Lord, but will be like St. John, the youngest of the apostles, who with Jesus' mother is at the foot of the cross. If we do our job properly, Greg, if we carry out our mission, if you carry out your mission, the young people of kings will be among those disciples who will have stood with St. John at the foot of the cross and not abandoned the Lord. Those prepared to pay the price because they fear God more than they fear men. And they will be among those who are able to carry out that witness and to exemplify that courage in this culture, at this time, on the great issues of the day, on the sanctity of human life, on the dignity of marriage, on the rights of conscience and religious freedom, because they are truly the real deal and they recognize that Good Friday is not forever. Good Friday is just a way station on the road to Easter. When the Lord rises, conquering death through death and making possible our eternal life with him in the divine economy of the Blessed Trinity. We are Easter people people of hope, capable of enduring Good Friday and standing at the foot of the cross precisely because we do have that hope. Now, Greg, as you know, I grew up in West Virginia. And although I'm a Catholic, growing up in West Virginia, I knew a few evangelicals. 
I even knew a few Baptists, more than a few Baptists. Now, there's a saying that uh, Christians have. You've heard it. The devil has all the good songs. Well, we Catholics say the Baptists have all the good songs, and they really do have all the good songs. And some of those songs really do tell the story. They tell us what it's all about. And though we didn't sing it in my church, there's a wonderful old hymn that's known to you all that is the story for us today, in this day, at this time, when we can no longer be comfortable Christians. That song begins with those words so familiar, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Shame. Something to bear in mind when we will be tempted, when you young people will be tempted. Greg, when you will be tempted, and I will be tempted, to be ashamed of the gospel, to fear what people will think of us for standing up for righteousness. That symbol of suffering and shame, that old rugged cross, that's what we need to keep in mind. But to me, it's the end of the story as captured in that fourth and final verse of the song that's really what it's all about. To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. That's what we need our young people to believe and to commit themselves to. To that old rugged cross I will ever be true. On that Good Friday, when Jesus is taken down from that cross, that moment of despair, that moment when it all seems lost, no, we remain true. To that old rugged cross I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear it's shame we're going to be made to suffer shame to feel ashamed not to be with it they shame you by calling you a bigot a hater a misogynist oh they'll tell you you're on the wrong side of history History is going to think of you the way we think about those racists, Orville Faubus. Because progress is moving on. And progress puts that old Bible in the shade. That old Iron Age book of myths, as Richard Dawkins calls it. But we need our young people, and all of us, need to be able to sing that song and mean it. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Why? Because then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. Sing it with me now. And I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. That's what the Lord has in store for us, my brothers and sisters. God bless you, Greg. Lead them there.